Up was conceived as a title about eight years ago, I think. Uh, I had a lot of material even then, and it was still quite a lot of it. It was quite positive, and and I was thinking about uh, rivers and also playing with up the Kaiba, up the Ganges, up the Mississippi series, where I would send the record off to a group in different countries, and they would do their interpretation of it, and then we'd try and sort of pull something together out of that or put those out as individual things. So it was a sort of uh, up package. But I think I'd mention that to Michael Stipe and uh, and they were the first to come up with a, a record called Up, although I think now Shania Twain is going to have a, a record called Up and Annie DeFranco had a record called Up, 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 I think. There was some argument of whether it's past its sell-by date and we actually put it up on the website whether people wanted it or not and I think it was um, just in favour of, of the uh, Up vote. So I decided to uh, keep up. I think also there's this thing about up and down uh, in the record too and uh, and I'll be playing with that on tour. So things last time were these two stages of male-female stage and urban, rural uh, and this next lot has sort of shifted 90 degrees and more about heaven and earth I think. Up is a positive word, and I think um, if I listen to the music now, there's some pretty miserable songs there, so I don't know that it fits that well, but I've sort of grown with it. And I think perhaps, yeah, personally, I'm in a good place at the moment, and I think probably more up than previous couple of albums, say, and so maybe there's some relationship there, but I don't think there's so much relationship in the music itself. Um, and I've always found it harder to write happy music than sad music. And I had sort of thought that there was a bit of a hospital anthem of sort of so us up that I could string together. Uh, so it had a sort of logic to it. Well, the record I was going after was the amount of time it takes to make a record. I think I enjoy the process of making music uh, better than being a traveling salesman. So I think I've in part been a sort of avoiding getting into it. And then I do tend to get attracted to um, detours, to the accompaniment of trumpet. And, and um, Ovo with the Dome was one of those detours. And then there was this soundtrack, Long Walk Home. And I also want to try and take stuff in, because I think often, uh, you, you know, when you make a record, you're spewing stuff out. And unless you've had enough input, how can you expect it to be interesting or have any new things to reflect on or comment on? I think uh, that process is a slow process for me. And if I go into the studio there, we've got 130 song ideas, not all finished songs that we were working on. So I would to go from one thing to another and then to another. And um, I wasn't really focused on a small group of songs. People always ask me, when's the album coming out? And I always say September and never give away what year I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, it's sort of tended to drift a little further than I'd intended, but um, it feels uh, like there's a lot of stuff now ready to come out. I've been very fortunate that I don't have to put out a record if I don't want to. So it's, it's more when it feels ready and uh, when I feel ready to go out into the world again. They come from all over the place, and always on every record, there's been a, one or two that have been sort of left over from the one before. And Sky Blue on this record too came from an earlier period, so even before that, ten years. I think I just throw up 
stuff that interests me, whether it's from melodically or more often rhythmically, and then just keep trying to develop it. It's like trying to grow fruit, and eventually it feels so heavy enough or ripe enough, if you squeeze it, that it might bear some juice. Well, some of the ideas are there early on, um, and so helping to shape the feel of the music, but but the actual slog work of the lyrics is is something I have to go away for usually, and it's something like anything from half a day to ten days for me to nail a lyric usually, and. I would go away sometimes to stay in a bed and breakfast or drive around the place, and I had to do that on my on my own. And in fact, I think that um, travel is good for lyrics for me. I still come in most days, at least by midday, and I'm rarely out before midnight. You know, and I think. This is actually a very sad life sometimes, uh, and I want to. I do want to cut that down and have more civilian night times. I have a sort of messy, sprawling technique of writing, really, which you throw all this stuff at the wall, and then you just chip away and spiral inwards and try and find the center. I remember talking to George Martin about this as a sort of production technique, and he was appalled. You know, the, all the sort of the waste and the uh, involved, uh, you know, because he he could only envisage, you know, having a definite result in mind that you went straight to, and you knew how to get there. I mean, I've tried that too, but I'm just not very good at it, and that's, uh, you know, I, I work this other way. I think all the computer stuff has affected the the writing. I mean, the ease with which you can change things and try ideas. So, I mean, generally, music when I started was about what you could achieve that you could generate yourself. And now it's much more what you can conceive of. We always seem to be trying to, to push the technology one stage further than it's ready for. Um, so there's a lot of time sitting around while computers get fixed. But the, the possibilities are fantastic. So I think there is that shift away from physical technique towards ideas that has happened as a result of the technology. You have now not just the musicians that you happen to know or can afford to pay, but a huge range of sounds at your disposal. So the process of how you make decisions becomes much more critical. And, and I guess that's something which also slows me down. Having a studio for me is an incredible luxury for two reasons. One, it allows me without worrying too much about money to explore ideas as much or as little as I, as I want. But more important in some ways, there's a really wide range of music being created around here. And, uh, and uh, that feeds me, you know, just hearing stuff, just talking to people. And if I hear a, a particular musician that I think, oh, that's great, that would be fantastic on that track. You know, I can try and uh, hijack them and I think having the studio here has really served me as an artist uh, in keeping me amongst musicians and music. We started off um, when I had a place in Senegal and, and we went out there to do some of the writing and work with some of Yusu's guys who I've worked with many times now, and they're fantastic. Um, I didn't at that point have much in the way of the songs developed, so it was a little premature, but um, it was interesting, because then we went to the mountains in France and um, went out on learning to snowboard at that time. Uh, and in fact, it was interesting comparing the hot 
environment versus cold environment because uh, my house didn't have air conditioning or anything like that so I would sit there sometimes with a, a towel on my head full of ice cubes water dribbling because it was incredibly hot and and I and everything in Africa takes you know about five times as long to get done as you imagine so what is already a slow process was I think even slower there even though the musicians and the people uh, were fantastic. France, actually, when we were there, was uh, was great. We would work in the morning, we'd get out on the snow in the afternoon, and we'd work in the evening. And it was the most efficient, so sort of creative period for me, even though it sounds, you know, a bit of a con. And I find, too, when I'm on the snow, I cannot think about anything else but, you know, probably trying to stay up and survive. So uh, it's really relaxing. I think it brings air into music and it sort of takes it into places that, that you wouldn't normally go. And I think there are real advantages sometimes to being in a band and the real advantages being outside of a band, being a sort of solo artist. And I think that I have the best of both worlds in that I try and do some band sessions where you get people playing together that know each other, that have shorthand. Uh, and at the same time, um, we then take quite a while to bring in other people and try different um, adventures on each song. The key to collaborating is to listen. You know, and, and to allow someone space to do what they can do well. Uh, and, you know, I am so fortunate both through this place with Real World Records and WOMAD and just who we've got to know over the years that we know a lot of extraordinary musicians. So uh, that's how I like to work. I think we're trying to get the best of both worlds. I've, I think I've always wanted to have my cake and eat it. I think some bits are personal and um, some bits are less sort of specific about relationships and more sort of observations on life really I think and um, I would say it's less relationship focused but uh, still quite a personal record. He has very clear ideas about what is good and bad. I don't always agree with them, but it's very useful having someone in the process, you know, who's uh, as as clear as as he can be. Uh, Maeve, my wife now, is also similarly very critical when she was working here too, and we get different people to score ideas. In fact, I mean, because this record has gone on for so long. It was, uh, even though we've been going out seven years before that, she was working here, and um, it, I asked people to score things out of a hundred, and most people are sort of polite enough to keep the score above fifty. But she, I think, went down to fourteen on one occasion, and <laughs> uh, and um, but it's and it's useful, I think, for me to have some uh, scathing critics before the record goes out in the world. Peter Green is someone who I think was, you know, one of the key uh, British musicians um, when I was growing up, and enormously talented. Clearly, he did go off the rails, rails a bit, but uh, I think very often, if someone has that amount of ability, that there are, are going to be um, that it can resurface in all sorts of ways. I was very keen to, to see if we could persuade him to play something on it. And in fact, he did a session down here and then a session in the studio where he normally works. And I sort of wanted a solo that was sort of, uh, is in the style of the solos that I grew up with that would sort of float above it. But he, he really didn't want to sort of grab the limelight and steam in there. He was sort of sitting back in a supportive role.
then he did a couple of tracks. In fact, there's one which will now, I think, be on the next record, but um, did some fantastic playing. And he's uh, he's an extraordinary player. And what also I like about him is that he um, uh, wants the stuff ahead of time. So he's got a sense, he does his homework before he comes into the studio. Most people uh, just turn up on the day and, you know, far away. But I think because he's so loose in one way, but so precise in another, uh, that he, he likes to get some sense of, of the of phrases he's going to use and the sort of type of motifs that he's going to put around places. But it's, um, he's an extraordinary character and a great pleasure to work with. I can hear um, some things that seem to have uh, some relationship, but I mean, I remember seeing Patti Smith interviewed once when she was saying there's sort of a whole punk phenomenon, all modern music had come out of her music, and I thought, well, I know it's easy to think like that, but hold on a minute. <laughs> As with myself, I respond to a, all sorts of influences, and I think most other people do. I think when you're late teens, early 20s, there may be particular artists that you try and emulate and uh, ape. Um, and often, uh, actually, you find yourself by trying to imitate the people you like best. So I would never discourage anyone from copying any artist, because uh, I think that's how you can find your own voices by exploring others. Yeah, I'm going to do some touring around this record and venture out on the road again. Um, initially in America, I'm sort of signed up to do a tour there November, December, and then uh, uh, I'm sure to do something in Europe next year. I still really enjoy visual things, and uh, Rob Lepage, who I worked with on the last tour, who I think is a sort of real uh, visionary, and um, I don't normally enjoy going to the theater that much, but his work, it's really theater for people who've grown up watching films. Uh, it's very visual and um, what I would call high moisture content. Uh, there seems to be sort of some mystery and depth and uh, emotion around it. So. Some of the things I enjoy doing most now are brainstorming with interesting people and uh, and doing a visual tour you know gives me a chance to, to do that, um, particularly with Robert. In the early days of video, there were no rules really, so it was uh, a lot freer in a sense because people didn't know what was required to make a successful video. Uh, if it looked interesting, entertaining, or different, it sort of tended to get on. Now, you know, the, it's, a, it's a more cynical commercial environment, and, um, and I think it's quite difficult for people that are trying to make something work uh, artistically, if you like, visually, um, to get enough plays to uh, warrant the budget that, to create it. All a healthy part of growing up. Um, so. <laughs> I can look at it in a more detached way now, in a more critical way, I think. But um, uh, I think the good things that, that had some spirit and emotion still work for me, and there's, there's quite a lot of stuff that falls by the wayside. I think I would draw a big distinction between writing a song for a film where you're sort of doing your thing and they're slapping it in there, often to try and get a soundtrack album that they can get a bit of cash back on, but that's another story. And 
creating a soundtrack, which is where you're trying to really build ambiences and sound landscapes that will sort of serve whatever's going on in the picture. Darkness was titled House in the Woods and is about fear. For myself and for a lot of other people, uh, it's it's the fear that, that stops you doing things that you could gain an awful lot from. So I was just sort of looking at that in myself. It feels to me more a sort of bookends record and it looks at beginning and end of life more than the middle period. And uh, so the sort of childhood references in this song. I grew up on this farm um, near Horsell Common, which is where the Martians landed in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, but um, it was quite a sort of moody place to play in uh, as a kid. And there was this um, woman who was squatting in the woods in a caravan, and uh, you could never tell if it was occupied, but you know we, we'd heard noises in there from time to time. And there was a newspaper over all the, the windows, so you couldn't look in. I think to our sort of five, six-year-old imagination, she was a, a witch and uh, very scary. So we always ran very fast when we crossed the path by, by the, her caravan. My uh, brother-in-law uh, died of cancer. My parents are getting a lot older. You know, I've seen a, a couple of friends die, and then so death has definitely been more present in the last ten years, and uh, it's been quite interesting in some ways. And um, so I've read a bit more about it and so on. And and I think too, there's this sense very often that that people seem to retain their um, 17 year old selves throughout life in some way. I mean, they may peg it at a different age, but uh, I don't think uh, people feel old internally or very rarely. Uh, physically, they do. Um, and there was this sense of never really having landed, you know, at the, at the point when you look back over life and maybe float somewhere else. Sky Blue is the oldest track on the record, and in fact, we had one go at it on the last record, maybe even been before then. Um, in fact, the, the original sort of riff, dee da da dum down, uh, is probably 15 years old or something. It's, uh, but it was something I'd always liked and felt had some good emotion in it. And as a teenager, I was sort of very influenced by soul and blues, and uh, and that was my sort of starting point to a lot of music. And I think this was definitely an influence on that track. And we made it less of a band piece and emptied out the, the mix. And I had the wonderful chance you know, to work with the Blind Boys of Alabama, and they are just extraordinary uh, voices. I mean, extraordinary people too, but the voices are lived in. Uh, and they have a different type of um, quality to them than young voices. I think it's one of my favorite sort of emotional bits on the record. The rhythm track uh, of No Way Out was one of the earliest uh, we began working on, and then it had more of a Latin feel. Chris Hughes took it and um, did this sort of programming thing with it, um, which with a thing called Super Collider, but it's, what it tends to do is break everything up into lots of little pieces and then sort of reassemble them, but still very granulated. Uh, and uh, it has this sort of strange, mysterious percussion quality to it. I mean, I think throughout, I've, on this record, I've been lucky enough to work with some of the best drummers in the world, some extraordinary percussionists, and um, that is definitely one of the things that gives me pleasure.
One of the things over the years that's sort of amazed me in some ways is how people use songs once you sort of say goodbye to them. And there was one uh, American comic um, who came up to me and I'd always liked his work and said, you know, I think that song, Don't Give Up, Save My Life. And, um, you know, I was suicidal and uh, just kept on playing it. And, and all sorts of other people have sort of used that song as an emotional tool, really. And I started to think, well, if you have songs as emotional tools, then what do we not really have? And, and there aren't really many songs that deal with grief properly, I think. So I, I thought, okay, I'll try and deal with a, a grief song. It sort of starts off, you know, with this pretty melancholy loss. And then you have this sort of sense that life is coming back in the middle. And then at the end, a gentle reminder that actually you have lost something that you loved. So it was um, sort of constructed, if you like, as an emotional tool. Well, in a way, this is the odd man out on the album because it's uh, all of the other tracks grew out of the sort of uh, the sessions, and there's still many other songs. But when we were sort of selecting which out of, say, the final 30 to, to go for more specifically to try and nail, um, this came back into the running because it's always been one that I've enjoyed a lot. And so when we were looking at all the different stuff that was around, it seemed like um, it was more up than some of the other tracks and might be a nice counterpoint. It's probably, again, along with Sky Blue, the most sort of soul references um, in, the, in the music and uh, uh, in some ways th the least thought about and it you know, grew out of a, a sort of a jam effectively. The melody I'd actually proposed for the Dome project, um, and it had been sort of rejected, but I always liked it. So I thought I'd do a lyric to it. It's of the bookends approach lyrically. It's it's the tail end uh, that uh, you're looking at there, as sort of parachute drop, as um, without knowing where you're going to land. Barry Williams is yeah, definitely an observation on TV culture, and uh, I didn't realize at the time of choosing the name Barry Williams, which was effectively out of a hat, there would be various um, well-known Barry Williams as a Welsh rugby player, as uh, an actor who was in the Brady Bunch in America, and, and now it's sort of, we've got samples that have been running on our website, and so people are sort of speculating on why I would make references to the Brady Bunch and so on. And I think we're also sort of dealing with the uh, uh, lyrics and whether they're going to get on radio now, which is something that really hadn't occurred to me because I don't think any of the lyrics are things that you wouldn't find in a Sunday newspaper or in um, teenage magazines in, uh, in some way. But, um, but it was quite fun writing it. The mood of it was something that um, uh, I liked, and there was a, a a moment in Africa, in fact, when the um, one of the echo machines jammed, so sort it of started malfunctioning, and I liked the sound of it. And so the loop is actually from this um, uh, Delta Lab echo unit that was crapping out at the time. I was just thinking about, um, I think it's a depressed state, but where you suddenly have heightened consciousness of sound and um, it's a bit like when you're about to throw up suddenly smell goes into 3d if you know what I mean that it, it becomes a sort of heightened experience 
So I was just trying to picture it that that this world in which this, the sounds, I mean, which I think is something that I know from, from my own experience, but uh, your consciousness is sort of drifting, but um, for some awareness that is uh, uh, retained. More than this came uh, right at the end, and I'd started a thing with guitar samples. I was mucking around with guitars, and Daniel Lenoir left his beautiful telecaster here. I can't play guitar to save my life, but I can make noises on it, which is sort of, uh, it's like mirror guitar, you know, and uh, hair flowing, but, um, oh, single hair flowing as it is now. And uh, the, uh, Samples we were getting. Um, I was then manipulating them on the keyboard, and and the first sound you hear on this track is is that sort of thing. So that was built around that. Um, but uh, I'd always liked it, and in fact, yeah, I was actually driving through the Italian Alps. It's, again, it's one of these scenic detours that um, I, I found this art cassette which had got this stuff in, and then I'd been playing around with a different sort of groove. Um, and, and that started all to make sense to me at that point. Those are Fatty Ali Khan is, uh, you know, I, I, one of the most extraordinary singers, I think, of our time, and it was very sad for us to, to lose him, and, uh, and I was very lucky that he'd worked on this track bef before he died, and, uh, it was, um, uh, I don't know, it was just such a powerful thing that uh, I, I was really keen to finish it and make it uh, a sort of centerpiece for the record. And um, it was a much sort of starker thing that he sang to, um, but I wanted to, to try it in this string thing. And it's, it's I think, in a way, the most filmic. And uh, I think they're gonna be using the instrumental of this in Gangs of New York now, but it's, um, it, I'm happy with that because it always seemed a, a sort of a large visual song. Uh, and working with the strings at the end, that was a very slow process. Um, and I spent uh, sort of a week um, working through it with Will Gregory, um, who's been doing the um, golf rap. Uh, material with Alison and uh, but there's another sort of local bath person and very talented um, and it's the sort of dirtiest I've got my hands in the actual sort of string arrangements and that was very satisfying uh, in terms of trying to generate also some melodic and harmonic things that um, uh, were quite clashing in places and then hear them all put together um, so that was the other thrill for me on that track. I'm really hopeful that uh, there'll be at, at least one other record out um, within sort of 18 months or after this. So um, it depends you know, how much touring and all the rest I do, but it, it shouldn't take that long and a touch wood <laughs> to, f to finish it off because there are some tracks finished uh, some I'm sure I'll rework a bit but um, but a lot of the writing has been done and the lyric which is often the, the longest slowest part you know I have quite a few lyrics now so it's a, um, it feels good to have something in the bank as it were <laughs> 